Good morning. Good morning. Happy Monday. Welcome to Convocation. As you're settling in, uh, we have a couple of quick announcements before we get to our speaker for this morning. Uh, first, we have Yop, which might have a slide. Okay, by now you guys should know what we're up here for. It's Yop. <laughs> Yay. We're going to do the wave. Ready? <laughs> you don't even have to stand up. Starting over here. Ready? Go. Whoa. Whoa. That was crazy. Yop. That so was remember, uh, you missed the early bird deadline, but I know you still have stuff. It's due by March 13th. Yop till you drop. <laughs> what a fun announcement. Um, hi, I'm Anna Weens. I'm here on behalf of FemCore this morning. Um, can we get the slide that has, yes, that one. So as some of you know, it's Women's History Month. Woo, we gotta celebrate. So um, as a part of that, each day um, during the month of March, we're gonna have a different member of FemCore come up and give you like a quick 30 second, one minute spiel on important women of history. Um, and I'm gonna start off with Bell Hooks this morning. Bell Hooks, born Gloria Jean Watkins in 1952, is an acclaimed author, teacher, academic, and social activist. Hooks' career took off after the publishing of her book, Ain't I a Woman, in 1981, which examined the effects of racism and sexism on black women, the civil rights movement, and feminist movements from suffrage to the 1970s. Since then, Hooks has published more than three dozen books covering topics of gender, race, class, spirituality, teaching, and the significance of media and contemporary culture. Today, Bell Hooks is widely regarded as one of the most, as one of the most important intellectuals and writers of her generation. So that's the spiel. Um, we'll have different folks come up during the month of March, give something to one of this, and um, we'll also have a, have a couple of other events um, throughout March that will be coming out soon, so thanks. Uh, good morning, Thresher Nation. First of all, I want to say a huge thank you to all of you that made the three-hour, over three-hour trip down to Oklahoma Wesleyan on Saturday evening. It was a fantastic environment. I know we came up three points short, but it was an unbelievable atmosphere. And so a special thanks to all of you that rode on the bus, as well as those that went uh, and drove your own. I think we had almost 70 students there total. So it was an excellent job by uh, all of you Thresher fans. So a huge appreciation for that. Uh, this morning, we want to recognize the three individuals that have qualified for uh, indoor national field uh, track and field. So if those three individuals would come up here. As well as Coach Parsley, please join us up here as well. Uh, we have, don't stand here in the corner, guys. Move on out of here from there. So we have Austin Cheatham here, uh, Braylon Brewer, and Kimroy Cupid. Austin qualified in the shot put. Braylon in the 400 and Kimroy in the 60 and the 200. Side note there, I was at the indoor meet on Saturday or Friday night a, a week ago. Um, Kimroy might have been the fastest human being I've ever seen in person uh, at that meet when he ran a, a quick, pretty quick uh, 200 that evening. Might have been the fastest in the country at that point in time. But anyway, um, really excited to watch these individuals uh, compete this coming week up in South Dakota. And I'll let Coach Parsley talk about them here real briefly about uh, what they've accomplished this year and when you can expect them to compete this coming weekend or I guess later this week. Coach Parsley. Do I get to use this? Okay. Um, first, um, thanks, uh, Tony. Um, it's been a great season. Uh, it's my first year here at Bethel, um, but we're here to, to talk about our national qualifiers. To give you guys an idea, most of you guys have played play sports. Track's a little different than other sports. We don't play one team. We go against a bunch of teams all at the same time. Um, so, so to give you some perspective, right now, Austin Cheatham, our shot put uh, thrower ranks fourth in the entire country of all the throwers that threw shot put all year long. So that's about a thousand throwers. Um, so out of a thousand athletes, Austin Cheatham right now ranks fourth in the nation. Um, yes. Austin's throw this season, um, he was our only conference champion um, in the indoor season in shot put. He was the conference champion for us. He also if he would have thrown his, his, nor, his, his PR or his throw that he threw earlier in the year, it would have broke the conference record. So um, we're excited about um, what, what he can do at nationals. He will throw on Saturday um, of, the, of the national championship meet. Um, Braylon Brewer uh, ranks 13th in the nation. 
Um, roughly about 1,500 athletes have run the 400 this year in the NAIA, and he ranks 13th currently, but is less than a tenth of a second out of the top eight. I talk about the top eight a lot because the top eight is All-American. So if you're in the top eight in an event, you finish All-American. And right now, he's less than a tenth of a second off of being in the top eight currently. Uh, that, so, yes. <laughs> Kemroy Cupid um, is new this year, same with Austin. Um, Kemroy set the um, school record, the, the conference record, and the preliminaries. If you understand track, it's, um, there's sometimes prelims, and then you have finals. Um, in the preliminary meet, he went into finals first in the 60 meters at conference, and he was also not only first in the 200 meters, but at the time, we're in the fastest time in the country. So out of 1,500 runners, he ran the number one time in the nation in the 200 meters completely by himself in the preliminaries, um, setting the conference record by almost a half a second. And then, um, yes, yep. He uh, unfortunately pulled up in the finals of the 60, wasn't, he was able to finish, um, but he did finish in last place out of the finals and was not able to run the 200 meters um, due to an injury, so we're hoping he will be able to compete this weekend. But right now, Kemroy ranks 10th uh, in the nation in the 60 meters, which um, it's such a short race, he could, he could finish anywhere between first and 10th right now. It's that close. And on the, in the 200 meters, his time uh, of 21.8 on indoor facility ranks fourth in the nation. Um, so it's exciting because going to nationals, we have a chance to bring home three All-Americans. It's not the expectation, but it's a realistic goal for us to be able to do that. Um, and I don't think that's happened at Bethel in a long time. So it's really exciting to see where we're at. What's also exciting is none of them are graduating. Um, so we, it's a really strong foundation for us in the future. Um, and before I go, I do wanna say thank you guys um, for an awesome winter. It's cheer and dance, um, men's and women's basketball. It was great um, being able to celebrate your successes and I look forward to continuing that in the future. So thank you guys. Thank you to all of our athletes, great work. Uh, so uh, today I'm happy to introduce again to the podium President John Gehring. Today, President Gehring is going to be talking about his research experience in ecology and natural history. So I will turn it over to President Gehring. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm happy to be here. Uh, we scheduled this quite a while ago, and uh, I have to tell you, I'm really excited about it. We don't get to talk about science a whole lot, but that's what we're gonna talk about today. This is gonna uh, be a number of uh, things. It's gonna be a little bit of a, of a life sketch. It's gonna be about doing science, and uh, it's gonna have some great pictures and some even better audio files. But those come towards the end, and uh, I'm gonna move pretty quickly uh, through them. So. Uh, I know you know this, uh, but if you'll just tell me what the scientific method is, the way you've learned it, that's where we'll start. Okay, so you need a hypothesis, right? What else? A question. A question first, right? You need a compelling question first. What else? Observations. And you need to test it reproducible and reproducible methods. <laughs> Probably the scientific method has been presented to you as what appears like a dance, like a seven step sequence. Yes, Does that sound familiar? Five steps, seven steps. This is the diagram I prefer. And it comes from uh, the University of California at Berkeley. It's a, it's a, it's a free resource up there uh, on a website called Understanding Science. And as you look through it, although it looks overwhelming at first, you realize that there's uh, all, the, all the things we just talked about are up here. Uh, for example, uh, here's the exploration discovery. There's the observations, the questions. Uh, here's some of the uh, hypothesis testing. You know, you develop the hypothesis, you make some observations, and then there's this community analysis and feedback over here, and some benefits and outcomes that don't typically get get talked about in that seven-step seven sequence. 
You'll notice all the arrows connecting those parts. It's not a linear process where you go from step one to step seven. At the risk of offending uh, my colleagues, I want you to forget that part. I want you to remember this here, okay? Because this accurately reflects what's going on. And I would also add and draw your attention to the upper corners, right? How do you get started in science? Well, you can be curious, right? And you're gonna see some examples today of curiosity. Or you can identify a practical problem, or maybe there's new technology. Sometimes it's serendipitous. Other times you make a surprising observation that leads your way into the scientific uh, method as it's presented up here. Importantly, this is a dynamic process. It's open to everybody, and you can see that by those uh, arrows up there. And of course, today it's relevant to, uh, to almost everything we think about. At the outset, I said that uh, I was going to talk about ecology and natural history. I'll take just a moment to define those. Uh, those are branches of biology that are focused really on the relationship between organisms and the environment. Ecology, the scientific study of the interactions that determine the distribution and abundance of organisms. So people are concerned with what species are where and what organisms are where. Why are they there? What are they doing? Right, that's the study of ecology. Preferably what you would do is run experiments or, or quasi-experiments, but you would, you'd wanna, uh, you'd wanna experiment in ecology. The core of ecology, or the heart of it, is what's called natural history. It's a study of organisms in their natural environment, leaning more towards observation than experimentation. It's really how all science starts, is through natural history and observing. Ecology covers a range of studies, everything from the, the physiology of individuals in different environments. For example, what happens to your body if you're in 100 degrees Fahrenheit? What happens if you're in zero degrees Fahrenheit? Uh, to things as large as the ecosystems and climate change. All that's covered by ecology. And I would argue today that we live in an ecological world, even though sometimes we don't recognize it. Uh, but we do, and we have to, we have to learn about it. And so I'll, I'll just tell you, I have a goal today. Uh, and that goal is to get at least one of you to switch your major to biology and become an ecologist. <laughs> and if I can't do that, I want you to be aware of some of the organisms and issues that I talk about today. Back to uh, natural history. I love reading natural history. And some of the best natural history comes from people who put on a backpack and wandered out into nature and uh, started, started observing and writing down what they saw. This is a passage from Joseph Grinnell about a bird called the California Thrasher. That was a bird called the California Thrasher. I love this statement, right? Strong feet and legs, muscular thighs, and equipment which betokens powers of running. Right, so the California Thrasher doesn't fly all that much, but it runs around through the bushes. It's great. And this is a wonderful description of the California Thrasher. And it's Joseph Grinnell. Anybody ever heard of Joseph Grinnell? I, heard, I saw one hand. I, I bet there's more. It, <laughs> which, I know that you can see this, but uh, Dr. Mendes Harkler was raising her hand. She's, uh, she's out there in the, in the foyer because she uses the Grinnell method of taking notes. And so if any of you ever had class and had to take notes, uh, field notes, it's probable that the technique you used was started by Joseph Grinnell. Good writing. You might ask yourself why ecology matters. Uh, well, it matters for everything from food, uh, to agriculture, to the air we breathe, to the existence of human beings, to the spread of viruses, right? It's all ecology. Why is a virus now spreading into places it hasn't been before? And how is it doing it? Those are fundamentally questions about interactions between organisms and their environment. I'm going to start with my time here at Bethel College in 1992 to 1994 to give you some context. Anytime you see a green slide like this, it represents a transition in, in my life. What was happening in 1992 to 1994 uh, was that I was learning about several phenomena that were interrelated to one another. The first was that Species 
are not distributed equally across the globe, whether it's birds or mammals or trees. They don't occur everywhere. You don't find a pine tree everywhere, for example. You don't find the American robin everywhere. You only find them in certain places. And there's a particular pattern to that. It's called the latitudinal gradient in species richness or species diversity. And it's one of the most profound patterns of interest to ecologists on Earth. And the way it works is that as you go towards the poles, so the North Pole or the South Pole, in this case, we're looking at uh, North America and Central America here. So the North Pole would be up there. As you make your way from the pole to the equator, either in the Southern Hemisphere or the Northern Hemisphere, what happens in the case of birds here is that the number of species always increases, right? So if you're up in Alaska up here, you might encounter 100 bird species. That's how many have been documented in Alaska. As you make your way down into the desert southwest, oh, 210, 220, 220 in northern Mexico. And you continue all the way down here. We're going to talk about Belize later on. 240 over here, it's 420 species. 480, we get down here even further, and we get up to 520. What's going on? Why is that? It not only exists for birds, there's more species as you move towards the equator, but it works for trees. It works for mammals. It works for almost every living group of organisms. Why? When I was first presented with this problem, I was fascinated, so I immediately started going into the literature. That's part of the scientific uh, flow chart there that I showed you earlier and started reading about it. Turns out there's a lot of hypotheses uh, about it. And uh, I'm not going to go into all those today, but it continues to be an ongoing source of inquiry for ecologists. Something else was happening back in the 90s as well. We had just received word that a toad had gone extinct. This is the golden toad. The golden toad became something of a poster child for the mystery about extinction in the 90s because it occurred in a very small range of habitat in the cloud forest in Costa Rica. And people could, scientists who are familiar with the golden toad could go there and they could see it breed. Uh, they could count all the individuals. They knew them pretty well. And over the course of about two or three years, up until 1989, when they went back, the populations declined and eventually they didn't find any more golden toads and they were gone, and they've never come back. They're extinct. That's an extinction that has happened in my lifetime. What was going on there? Well, scientists didn't know, but they recognized that the populations were declining, not just for the golden toad to extinction, but for a lot of other species as well. I became interested in uh, the populations of, of frogs and toads here in Harvey County, and I became aware of a database that people collected about 25 years prior to my work. Uh, and so I endeavored for my senior thesis to go back and sample those same areas to figure out if the frogs and toads species that were there were still there, whether they existed or not. It's kind of a, a kind of backed up and, and uh, looked at the same areas. I didn't know it at the time, but it's a good way to try to figure out how populations have changed. There's a book that came out about four years ago. Those of you who are interested in natural history or English literature uh, need, should read it. It's called Walden Warming. And the subtitle is Climate Change Comes to Thoreau's Woods. It turns out that Henry David Thoreau uh, was a fantastic naturalist. And one thing he did is he went out every single day in winter and spring to record the first flowering event for probably 40 species of wildflowers. He had to walk several miles a day because he didn't want to miss a single individual plant flowering. And he kept track of all of it. <laughs> he kept track of ice out dates on Walden Pond. He kept track of the arrival of birds. And so now, 170 years removed, scientists have gone back and they've done exactly what Walden did. They've taken this, this kind of retrospective look. And the signature of climate change is all over in the arrival dates, in the flower dates, and the ice out dates. It's a compelling book, and I encourage you to, uh, to uh, check it out or read it. My, my database was not as compelling, okay? 
uh, but still, it was, it was interesting. I found all the species that were supposed to be there, uh, and that was good news. I also took a trip to Belize. I think last week, uh, many of you shared your study abroad trips. Study abroad was a really important part of my life. We went to Belize uh, with faculty members from uh, Tabor and McPherson College, and uh, it was on that trip uh, down at the Blue Creek Field Station that I found my first red-eyed tree frog. And I found it by flipping over uh, a, a big a big frond, a big palm frond, and it was underneath, sleeping. And so this is the photograph of uh, just a, a beautiful uh, organism, the red-eyed tree frog. And so that, those, all those events together got me wondering about this question. How many species are there on Earth? I need some help. How many known species? So we have, you know, on campus here we have the American robin, right? Just the other day I saw some cedar wax wings feeding on the berries uh, out there. How many described and documented species are there on Earth? I get some numbers. Anybody? 85,000. 85, I heard 85,000. Everything, all living things. 8.5 million. I know where that came from. <laughs> That came from an early entry on the Google page. It turns out that scientists have described about 1.75 million species, ranging from animals and plants to viruses, bacteria. That's what they've described. How many there are is another thing entirely. 30 million, 50 million, 8.5 million. Right? It just depends. We don't know. And the reason we don't know is because we don't have enough experts to identify all of the living things on Earth. I implore you, if you have the right kind of mind or the interest and enthusiasm, become a biologist and spend your days working in remote locations, working in museums to try to identify what we have on Earth. It's very fulfilling. All you have to do is be curious about it. That's really all. After my time at Bethel, I went to graduate school. I knew I wanted to do that as well. Uh, and so I went to Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. I worked on birds in the Bahamas for a while, trying to figure out what, uh, what bird species were there. I'm not going to talk much about that. I'm going to talk a little bit about something that came to me as I tried to figure out what a career in academic ecology would look like. My advisor said to me, he said, John, why do you want to work on ecological communities? And I said, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, there's populations, right? We're a population of humans in this room. There's populations. They're fairly easy to figure out. And then there's ecosystems, where you, all the non-living material you have to account for. But ecological communities, this is an assemblage of a whole bunch of different species, why on earth would you want to do that? And I said, well, what's wrong with that? And he goes, well, they're middle number systems. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, there's low number systems, like what happens in psychology when you're trying to predict the behavior of a single individual. You know, you can predict the behavior of your roommate, right? By now, if you've lived with your roommate for a while, you might be able to say, oh, I know what's going to happen there. I can predict. That's a small number system, right? One or two, you can predict the behavior of one or two individuals. And then there's large number systems. Any chemists in here? Budding chemists? Ideal gas law, that's an example of predicting the, the behavior of lots of individual particles. And he said, well, ecology, they're middle number systems. They're hard to predict. Why? Because you have all these aspects that influence the number of species in a community. Everything from evolutionary history to disturbance to the landscape to nutrients to time, all that matters. And it's hard to figure out all those inputs. And I said, I'm, I'm ready. I like it. I'm doing it. Let's, let's go. And so this is the diagram I made for myself. <laughs> and I said, I'll, I'll, I'll start working on it. This is a better version, or another way to think about it. This comes from a 2010 paper, long before I was uh, uh, thinking what I was thinking. There's some processes that take place, and then there's this large unknown thing referred to as a black box of community ecology. And what it does is result in a whole bunch of patterns like the species area relationship or the latitudinal diversity gradient that I just talked about earlier, right? Something contributes to that, but what is it? 
I don't know, that's the work of ecologists. About the time I went to graduate school, uh, there was a, a paper uh, that was titled The Last Biotic Frontier. And I thought, well, what's the last biotic frontier? Uh, what do they mean by that? Where are we going for the, for the mystery? And it turns out it was in tree crowns. That was the last biotic frontier. Let's look there to see what lives in the tree crowns. Uh, at various times in the history of biology, the soil has been called the last biotic frontier, and more recently, the deep oceans, because we don't have a real good understanding of what's in the ocean in terms of species. But at the time, it was tree crowns. Why do you suppose tree crowns? Why would they be called the last biotic frontier? They're hard to get to, right? This is an account of a naturalist, uh, BB in 1917. He's standing there and he wants to go up in the tree crowns. But gravitation, <laughs> gravitation and tree trunks swarming with terrible ants kept him from going up there. In the meantime, in the 90s, right when I'm going to graduate school, there's a publication by a Smithsonian scientist named Terry Irwin. And he goes to Panama and he sprays insecticide in 19 individual trees. And what comes out of those trees? Almost a thousand species of beetles, excluding weevils, which are the most abundant type of beetle. There's all sorts of stuff in the tree crowns. Bassett, later, 5,100 canopy arthropods were collected, 750 species recognized. Nigel Stork, 23,874 arthropods representing 3,000 species. Turns out the tree crowns are full of all sorts of stuff scientists have never seen because it's hard to go up there. But that didn't stop us. <laughs> uh, we decided we would try to figure out what was accounting for all this diversity. And so we set up a grand study. And at the time, it was the largest of its kind in North America. We worked in Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia. Those little green dots represent study sites. There's some hashed lines in there I want you to, to note. Uh, because there's some names there, the North Central Till Plain and the Western Allegheny Plateau and the Interior Low Plain, but that doesn't figure prominently. These areas here, separated by lines, are called ecoregions. They're broad parts of the continent that have been shaped by forces over time and make them very different. The North Central Till Plain was covered with glaciers 10,000 years ago, so it's flat. Anybody from Indiana or drive through Indiana? It's flat. Mostly. That's part of the north central till plain. But if you go to eastern Ohio and West Virginia and those areas, what do you encounter? Hills, mountains, lots of trees. No glacial past. Right? No, no glacier was there to, to flatten all of it and change the soil. So we had, you can see three study sites here in the till plain and three study sites here. And the goal was that we wanted to figure out what was causing all the beetle diversity. Okay, we knew the beetles would be up there. Scientists have said there's, there's all sorts of stuff in the tree crown, all sorts of beetles. So we divided it into ecoregions, and then we had those three sites, and then within each site, we chose a mesic and a xeric. Familiar with the terms mesic? It means moist, xeric means dry. So some upland and lowland areas, uh, and then had four trees of different species. We're gonna sample all of them, right? And we're gonna do that to figure out at what spatial scale all this beetle diversity was being generated at, so to speak. We thought it was the trees, because all those studies I mentioned previously, they said, oh, if you go into an oak tree and spray insecticide or go up there and collect, you're going to find something very different than you're in a, if you're in a hickory tree. And we thought, well, it'll be all the different tree species. OK. So the first thing that had to happen was we had to figure out how to get insecticide up into a tree crown. This device here you might be familiar with if you've ever watched uh, Arachnophobia. It was a movie from the, I don't know, 80s, 90s. It's a big, they kill spiders with this thing. It's a big, it's a big insecticide fogger. And it runs on gasoline, but it's a kerosene-based insecticide. There's spark plugs and uh, it, the, the one we had was particularly prone to uh, belching flames. 
and uh, we were working in a lot of protected areas, and we, we, you can see there's ropes. So we were trying to control a thing like a puppeteer with a bunch of ropes, and it was a disaster. It took us one field season. We almost burned down several forests, uh, but we eventually worked with people who had airplane remotes, and we were able to figure out how to run it with remotes. Spray the insecticide in the tree crown early in the morning before the wind picks up. All the insects come down into these funnels. Those 96 trees, sampled two times, yielded 15,907 beetles. I had to handle each one of them. It's a lot of time on the microscope. 583 species um, and weevils were the most abundant, then these longhorn beetles, and then chrysomelids, leaf beetles. What did we find? Well, it turns out that when you do some data analysis, uh, these green numbers mean they were higher than what we expected. We thought the, the ecoregions, the sites, the stands, uh, and the trees might contribute equally. But it turns out that that broad effect of ecoregions, that history of glaciation, that's what really determined a lot of the beetle diversity, which was not at all what we expected. Season by season, so difference from June to August was also different. There's completely different beetles. This is all the early season beetles. These are all the late season beetles. And you can see that they, the species that are up there are very different. So we also have this effect of time. All this work yielded a couple of important uh, papers. Whoops. Uh, one was in conservation uh, biology. And I'm, I'm only pointing it out in, uh, because I want to I want to just tell you that we have these effects of broad spatial scales, uh, and we also saw all these rare species. We didn't know. We didn't, I wasn't able to identify some of what came out of the tree crowns, so it's truly uh, rare. We also did a related study on the number of species in the world, and uh, we figured that Terry Irwin's estimate of 30 million, however compelling it was, was much too high. And it was probably closer to five to 10 million species in the world. By the time all that work was done, I had some answers, right? I had the effects of spatial scales, at least for the beetles and tree crowns. Now you could do the study for all sorts of other organisms. We also had some interesting species interactions taking place. Uh, we'd learned a little bit about disturbance from some studies in Costa Rica uh, that I had done. Uh, and then the effects of landscape pattern. So I, all that was, was good, and what it spoke to in this instance was this right down here. That conservation biology paper was written as a policy paper. If you're gonna conserve ground, here's what you need to do, okay? So you enter into, uh, you know, kind of curiosity, you go through the scientific method, you end up here, right? And then you start over with other studies, and a number of, of good studies followed all that. After that, I left and uh, went to Truman State University in Missouri. Uh, and by this time, you figured out, just by the numbers, that I had killed a lot of beetles. And I was starting to feel bad about it. Uh, and so I thought to myself, well, I'm going to start working on some living organisms. And so uh, I started working after a few months on katydids. Anybody know what katydids are? I'm going to show you. They're, uh, they have uh, saltatory hind legs, which means they jump. Leathery forewings, there's about 6,000 species. They're omnivorous. Uh, and they're closely, well, they are. They're orthoptera, which is one of the large groups of insects. So crickets, grasshoppers, katydids, uh, all together in one big order. OK? And you can tell the difference by how long the antennae are. If they're short, it's likely a grasshopper. And the number of segments in one of the legs helps. And then, do they have their eardrums in their legs or not? Okay, because that's where the katydids have their eardrums in the legs. At the time, my training as an uh, ecologist was pretty much standard ecology. I hadn't thought a whole lot about evolutionary biology, but I started to integrate that into my work. Uh, most biologists, when they see this, will recognize a sketch uh, from Charles Darwin's B notebook. Uh, the first notebook, first notation he made in 1837 about the relatedness and the patterns of, of life on Earth continues to be a motivation. Uh, and what I wanted to do was bring uh, evolution in a strict way into my work in ecology. 
Uh, a number of scientists were calling uh, for this. Uh, this is one of the great studies done by uh, Rosemary Gillespie, who worked on uh, Hawaiian spider communities. You know, the Hawaiian islands, some are a lot older than the others because they're volcanic. And so she went and looked at the different spider species and communities on each of those islands. And they vary a lot depending on the age. So if you're keeping track of the kind of the, the diagram here, I want to address these two things to figure out what they meant for uh, species richness in a community. So we turned to some well-known habitats in the Midwest uh, because that's where we found ourselves. Prairies, pastures, and old fields. Prairies are largely undisturbed or should be undisturbed. They get burned periodically and grazed. Pasture gets grazed all the time. And then old fields, those are areas or habitats uh, that used to be a field and then the farmers just let them go. So a lot of, a lot of trees there. And the question I want to know, these are this is called a phylogeny. It's a pattern of relatedness uh, among species. And so this is a species, that's a species, that's a species. I want to know if certain species that were related to one another, whether they were clustering in habitats, we call it phylogenetic clustering. That is, would we see related species in the prairie only, those there? Or would it be something like this, where these closely related species sharing a common ancestor would occur in all three habitats? And so that's what we set out to do, working in, those, uh, working in those habitats. These are some of the pastures we encountered. We often had to avoid cows and horses during our work, kind of made it exciting. This is one of my uh, students. Uh, her name's Katie. Katie doesn't look very enthused there, uh, but Katie was highly enthusiastic, in fact. What she's doing is listening. Because the way you sample Katie did is you listen for them. You can catch them with a net, but it's better to listen. And so I want to talk just briefly here about sound production mechanisms. Um, how do you make sound? How do things in the animal world make sound? I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but there's a number of ways to do it. You can vibrate a membrane with a muscle. We're going to have an example of that in just a second. You can vibrate a membrane with air as in the case of humans, right? You're vibrating your vocal cords. You can hit a substrate. There's a particular kind of Katie did called the drumming Katie did. You know, that's how it communicates. Same is true with termites, which thump on the on the ground. And then you can stridulate. What does stridulate mean? Anybody know? It means rubbing body parts together, right? So that's it. Somebody did it right there in the front row. Stridulating. Right? That's what it means to stridulate. So I'm going to play some sounds for you now. Okay? This is a cicada. Cicadas use muscles to move membranes. This is the dog day cicada. It's the one that's common here in Kansas in August and September. Listen to it, and what's going to happen is its muscles are going to get tired at the end. It's muscle fatigue. Okay. That's cicada. I wasn't interested in cicadas, but I wanted to show it to you. There's tree crickets that sing on a regular basis. I'm using the word sing. It should be stridulate, right? And so tree crickets, it's either leg rubbing against wing, and that's the, in, in most cases, that's what's, what's going on. Here's the prairie tree cricket. It'll sound familiar to you. the snowy tree cricket. You've heard this one. It's called the temperature cricket. And uh, according to folklore, you can take the ambient temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is equal to 40 plus the number of chirps in 15 seconds made by the snowy tree cricket. We'll start with the 86 degree Fahrenheit, the one that's really warm.
76 degrees Fahrenheit. And 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Maybe. Slowly. Okay, you get the idea. Let's talk about katydids. They have special wing structures. They have a file, a little, a little, uh, a, a, what looks like a file, like a nail file, and then a scraper, a little peg on one wing. So a file on one wing and a scraper on the other wing, and then a mirror that acts like a drum to amplify sound. That's their, that's their wing structure. Here's a close-up of of one from the back, what they do is rub their wings together really fast and use the drum to amplify sound. All this is species specific, okay? No two species sound exactly alike. And why are they doing it, do you suppose? Mating, right? Mating and territory to some extent, mostly mating. So the, the males are out here calling, the females are doing all the choosing in the system because they're listening to the males call. I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to have to uh, hurry here. This is, they have great names. Neo, Kano, Cephalus. What does the prefix Neo mean? New, Kano, Cone, Cephalus. These are the new cone heads, right? The Neoconocephalus genus. It's a robust cone head. You, this has probably kept you awake at night if you grew up in the Midwest or South. No, they're attracting mates. This is the Nebraska cone head. Does it intermittently, it gives you a little break. Uh, I'm gonna skip over some here in the interest of time. There's one that became a favorite of our research group. It's Conocephalus fasciatus, called the Slender Meadow Katydid. For any of you who ever heard of a rainbird sprinkler, that green kind, you know, that goes around in a circle, you can kind of listen to the Slender Meadow Katydid. Called it the rain, the rain bird. Katie did. Here's one that sounds like a far off steam engine. And here's the one from which the term Katie did derives. Katie did. Katie did. Katie did. Here's one that's very common on our campus, at least uh, from July to October. Um, I'm, we're gonna, can you play the lower one, please, the tick? And then this one. Uh, you figured out by now that the katydids, uh, they, they avoid detection by, by being a leaf mimic. They all look like leaves, right? Except when they're pink, and then they don't last long. It's a genetic mutant, they get eaten right away, not surprisingly, and just so you know, this is an awful call. The rest have been pleasant, this is not. So what did we find? We found some evidence for this phylogenetic clustering, especially in the prairie, and especially with one group, those big neoconocephalus, those new cone heads. And we learned a lot about uh, katydids.
I think I told you at the uh, beginning that uh, I went to Belize uh, one time when I was here for a study abroad trip, showed you a picture of the frog. It turns out that I've been there 15 times uh, since then, led a lot of students, have done a lot of research. It's a fine country, with apologies to my uh, colleagues from Mexico sitting uh, right here in the, in the front. There's Belize, I suggest you go there if you get the, uh, the chance. Who, some of you were in Chiapas, yes, just recently. And so you're right, uh, right here. So similar latitude, remember that latitudinal gradient species richness. And so you probably see just as much in terms of species in Chiapas as you could in, in Belize. Uh, Belize has a very progressive environmental uh, policies. This whole area here called the Maya Mountain region uh, is an old, uh, an old geological formation. It's not necessarily high, these aren't the Rocky Mountains, uh, but they are unique. They're largely protected, and, and Belize has done a fantastic job with that. Some of the areas that we worked in uh, when we were down here include uh, agriculture and forest. Uh, Las Cuevas is a research site in, in what's called primary rainforest. We collected a lot of katydids out of cities. This is San Ignacio or Cayo, one of my favorite towns uh, almost anywhere in the, in the world. We worked in agriculture, beans, maize fields. Uh, we worked in uh, chocolate uh, plantations. This is cacao. Uh, we worked in coffee plantations. We worked in what's called low bush. Uh, and uh, so disturbed secondary forest. And we failed miserably. <laughs> because when you work uh, in remote areas, you have all sorts of problems. This is one of our field assistants. Uh, they, had gone to, uh, they had gone to this field station and it just was, nothing would work. There was no lights, there was no power. Uh, and people tried to help them, but it became very frustrating. So we had to abandon the project. And this was a master's thesis. This was kind of a significant abandon of what we had intended to do like we did in Missouri. What did we learn anyway uh, after kind of pressing on? Uh, look at some of these beautiful katydids, right? And the, especially the one in the upper right, a wonderful example of a leaf mimic. It's not just green, it has brown, it has the venation you'd see from a, uh, from a leaf. We learned some other things. Uh, we came across a uh, katydid in uh, Belize that was known not to occur in Belize, but was in Florida. So this is the, the distribution as we knew it up until the time we found it in Belize. And we had some fantastic natural history encounters. This is a katydid. First of all, uh, she's very handsome, um, if you want to use that uh, phrase. has beautiful markings on the face and on the front part of the wing. Katydids lay their eggs internally. They lay them in grass or they lay them in wood. But these are her eggs. And they're laid external to the plant which is fascinating, we've never seen it before. They're beautiful eggs, nonetheless. One of my students, uh, she got so frustrated, she started wandering the rainforest at night, uh, which takes a hearty, a hearty uh, disposition because it's, uh, you know, it's kind of scary. And she came across this. This here is the, the most exciting image I've ever seen from all my time as a natural historian or ecologist. That is a katydid laying an egg it's one of these National Geographic moments, right? Where you, you, know, you see the animals chasing or mating. This is egg laying <laughs> in a katydid in the middle of a forest, rainforest at night. It was about 2 a.m. when she came across this and photographed it. This thing here is called the ovipositor and she has the dexterity to insert it between the two layers of cells on either side of the leaf. That's the egg right there. And when she was done, she takes out the ovipositor, moves back, and lays another, or moves forward, inserts it in between those, those two layers of cells, and lays another egg. This took about 30 minutes of watching to get those two photographs. It's very slow. We learned a lot of other things as well. We learned that the National Insect Collection of Belize was in bad shape. This is the National Collection right here. For a country that has probably 65% of its area protected, for a country that's species rich, this is, the, this is the national collection. There was about two drawers of Orthoptera, that order that includes the grasshoppers, katydids, crickets. That was one of the drawers. When we were done with all our specimens, we took them all back. 
my students made a separate trip down there to deposit them, talked to the national entomologist and said, we want this material here will be of use for uh, Belizeans in, in generations to come. All the work that, you know, we, we failed in some aspects of the structured sampling design because of logistics, but we recognized range expansion, recognized some new behaviors, and also helped build that uh, collection down in Belize. Some people to thank here, uh, a lot of graduate students, a lot of undergraduate students, many graduate school collaborators who uh, worked with us, uh, mentors here, Dwight Platt, Dwight Crable, uh, graduate school mentors, Tom Chris, Dave Osborne, funding from the Nature Conservancy for a lot of that work, National Geographic Society, and of course the institutions themselves. Okay, uh, I know that, that uh, Doug Siemens once said that I always wait till three minutes, but I want to point out that there's 10 minutes left, and I'll take some questions if anybody has them. <laughs> oh, we're done. <laughs> we do have to let them out at 11.50, unfortunately. But thank you again to President John Gehring. Please give him a